75th anniversary rather of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Also Pakistan uh, China relations that have been getting better and better, stronger and more robust uh, in uh, these uh, 75 years. And of course, this is evident in, uh, in the way of uh, so many things, whether it be uh, the China Pakistan Economic Corridor, whether it be China always backing. Pakistan in the good and the bad times, whether it be China uh, taking Pakistan out of uh, all kinds of uh, uh, you know, uh, regional or international uh, issues uh, with such an ease that makes it an ideal partner to be not only in the region but also in the world. Today is the 75th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. They did of course celebrate it in Islamabad a couple of days back uh, but today is that official day and there have been many messages today as well from uh, different quarters whether it be from our Prime Minister, whether it be from the uh, Speaker National Assembly or the Chairman Senate or other leaders as well. They all are in unison when it comes to uh, Pakistan-China relations and the way uh, things are moving in the right direction. We have been joined uh, by two guests, uh, uh, one from China and of course one right here in the studios, one who joins us also again after a bit of a hiatus, he is back from China uh, after a short visit there as well, none other than Mustafa Heder Sayyid, Executive Director of Pakistan China Institute. Mustafa, thank you very much to have joined thank us. Thank you for having me, sir. Uh, Let us begin with you till such time that our Chinese correspondent uh, joins us. But uh, after this question, we will go to the Chinese correspondent. Yang Yudong, who is the Council General of China and Karachi, says the following on the 75th anniversary of his country. There is a long list, but I will try to cut it as short as possible. He says over the past 75 years, the Chinese people under the leadership of the Communist Party of China have created various Chinese miracles, which are rarely seen in the history of the world. World's most complete industrial system, most comprehensive transport network and resource corridors, uh, the world's second largest economy, world's largest uh, compulsory education, social security and healthcare system, moderately prosperous society, historically eliminated absolute poverty and people's sense of fulfillment, happiness and security is unprecedented, uh, building a modern socialist country in all respects and uh, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation through a Chinese part to modernization uh, uh, and of course the whole way that they are trying to build uh, China into a socialist country that is prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious and beautiful by the mid 21st century. This and so much, I mean, this is a huge list. How important are these developments from a global perspective? I think that uh, it is a case study mm. for uh, not only students and policy makers but countries that wish to undertake similar development, particularly those in the global south, mm. like ourselves, mm. to how we can move forward mm. uh, despite the challenges because uh, China like us had a huge population, mm. has a huge population and uh, they turned the population into an asset from a liability by making them a skilled workforce True. and lifting them out of poverty mm. and making them consumers. And now with the dual circulation policy that President Xi has initiated, mm. they produce for the consumers domestically rather mm. than only exporting. Mm. So uh, I think that uh, this anniversary is a great uh, opportunity for uh, partner countries of China, particularly Pakistan, to inculcate the lessons that China has undertaken from a very, very poor country mm. to what it is now. Yes, and just in 75 years. And, and, and 75 years and in the 1970s the Chinese leaders used to come to Pakistan mm. and uh, study Pakistan and look up to Pakistan and see how they can emulate Pakistan. Someone uh, the other day uh, was telling me about Biko mm. which was a factory, a very famous factory uh, in East Pakistan and uh, Ju and Lai visited it and the, the person is the third generation of the founder of Biko mm. and he showed me his uh, uh, visitor's book remarks mm. where he said that I will go back, Zhu Enlai, the leader of China, mm -hmm. the secretary general of the communist party, the president of China, mm. that I will send uh, our engineers to study this factory so we can emulate similar uh, industrialization in China and this was I think in the 1970s. Mm. So, uh, China has gone. Mm. Uh, Leaps and bounds forwards, <laughs> leaps and bounds, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, what can we do to get back where we were mm. at that time when countries like China were coming mm -hmm. to us? And mm. I think the answer is in uh, economic, pure economic growth, mm. political stability and harmony. Mm. So, I think we really need to engage 
very proactively with China in all sectors mm. and learn and get as look much as the we example, can. Example, look at how it has come. I mean, these are just some of the examples of how China has achieved what is it has achieved. And it I is, think there's I mean, no there's example no in history, Umar. Mm. There's no uh, uh, example in history of mm. any other country mm. that has uh, undertaken development and developed in such a efficient and fast mm. uh, way. True, I agree with you on that. We've also been joined by Dai Kai, who's a CGTN reporter, joins us from China. What is the sentiment like today uh, on the occasion of the 75th uh, anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China? Could you care to give us some comments? This is a moment that many have been waiting for. China's National Day holiday is finally here. You can feel the holiday vibe just by walking around the city. I'm reporting from Shanghai, and over the past couple of days, we've seen tourists arriving from all over the country and from abroad. Celebrations are happening not just here, but in cities big and small across the nation, as people enjoy a holiday that stretches over a full week. This means the demand for travel is soaring. Just recently, data from online travel platforms show that searches for National Day travel have skyrocketed, up by at least over 20 times compared to the same period last year. It's clear that people are eager to get out and explore. With the extended holiday, over 60% of travelers are choosing long-distance trips, while short trips make up only around 20%. There's also been a strong demand for outbound travel, with countries in Asia, Europe and North America being top choices for vacationers. China's transport authorities estimate that during this year's Golden Week holiday, cross-regional travel volume will hit 1.94 billion trips, averaging around 277 million trips per day. Of these, more than 80 percent of travelers, about 1.53 billion people, will opt for self-driving trips, while the remaining 20 percent will use trains, planes and ferries. As travel options become more diverse, it not only meets consumers' growing demand for travel experiences, but also drive more diversified growth in the tourism market. Industry experts believe we're likely to see this National Day holiday breaking new records in tourism spending. Back at CGTN, Shanghai. Thank you very much, Dai Kai, to have uh, joined us and to have given us an update on uh, today's auspicious uh, occasion. Coming to you, uh, Mustafa, uh, in a paper on China at 75 that was prepared by an organization called the Asian Institute of Eco Civilization, the author describes China's story of 75 years. He says that could be understood by six R's revolution, resurgence, resistance, reform, rise, and rejuvenation. Would you like to add to it? I think that. Uh it, the, this is an apt analysis and particularly the rejuvenation of the Chinese civilization. Mm. The Chinese nation is a very important concept. And <clears throat> if we rewind a little bit to the uh, century of humiliation that uh, China underwent, mm. 100 years of century of humiliation, mm. which was being colonized by great powers. Mm. Because a lot of the times when we talk about China, in, even here in uh, developing countries, there is this anxiety. Mm. And maybe that anxiety is injected uh, and curated mm. that uh, China will take over, mm. you know, mm. and you know, this will happen and there is this rise of the big red dragon. Mm. But the fact of the matter, Umar Bai, is that China has been colonized in the past. It has been a, at the receiving end. And that 100 years of civilization uh, of humiliation by Japan, uh, there is a French concession in Shanghai, but France mm. was also mm. there, you know. So, there were many multiple countries, Germany uh, has led to uh, this concept of the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, which is that now the Chinese nation is standing up mm. on its own two feet and that is economically mm. and it has reclaimed its sovereignty over the vast land of China and over its culture and over its identity mm. and no other power again will be able to subjugate it again. Mm. So, this is the, the uh, back story behind the rejuvenation of the Chinese mm. nation. And then all the other concepts are sort of uh, revolving and centering around it. The rise of China, the rejuvenation of China and of course, the opening up and reform which was undertaken by uh, Deng Xiaoping in 1979. Uh, and I think when we talk about the BRI which we have in mm. this program multiple times, uh, I call President Xi Jinping's uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, opening up and reform 2.0. <laughs> because it is exporting that opening mm. up and reform to other countries. True. So, uh, I think that uh, it is a great uh, moment uh, in time for China and its friends like us mm. to actually go delve deep and not only limit 
our cooperation to the China-Pakistan economic corridor, etc., which we often talk about, but to all facets mm. of how uh, they have alleviated poverty mm. and how they have used this huge population, which they had, to benefit themselves. Exactly. And to benefit their own nation as well, their own people. Yes. I think that is extremely important. Now, our Prime Minister, uh, uh, you know, has sent a very uh, nice message, which of course we all know the relationship that between Pakistan and the People's Republic of China. He talks about how proud uh, we are of China's remarkable progress and achievements under President Xi's visionary leadership. He talks about Pakistan and China as iron brothers and they're all with a strategic cooperative partnership that goes, that continues to grow from strength to strength and the commitment that both countries have to ensuring the success of China-Pakistan economic corridor and of course all Pakistan's resolve to continue to work closely with China to further strengthen these bilateral ties across various fora. How important are these messages? Nothing new there, but how important is the reiteration of this resort from the Pakistani side? I think that it's very important because I think uh, the Prime Minister uh, understands China very well because when he was the Chief Minister of Punjab, mm. he uh, led from the front and engaged mm. uh, particularly on CPAC projects uh, mm. very, very proactively and was a very regular visitor in China and is known very well in China. So, uh, I think the reiteration and uh, uh, reminding ourselves, our polity, mm. our civil society and also the Chinese is very important to maintain and enhance this relationship mm. because uh, as a developing country, as a country which is situated in a geopolitically very strategic place where we see that big power competition, great power competition is uh, only flaring up more and more. It's very important to have strategic clarity that uh, on our long time relationship with China, which has, uh, I believe, been very consistent in supporting our core interests, whether it's defense, whether it's uh, economic interests, whether it's uh, helping us and investing in Pakistan when no one was willing to invest in mm. 2013. True. If you remember the headline of Newsweek at that time, mm. Saab was the most dangerous country in mm. the world is not Iraq, it's Pakistan. Mm and China chose to invest in Pakistan at that time. So, because it was the confidence that China had in Pakistan. The confidence that uh, China mm. had in Pakistan and it's very important to maintain this confidence mm. and take this confidence forward because as we know that there have been challenges mm. uh, and there have been security issues, etc. Mm. Uh, but we must uh, make sure that we continue to have strategic clarity as we move forward in this uh, at a time when the region is uh, you know facing multiple challenges mm. and there are a lot of pressures on Pakistan. All right. Two uh, statements that have come also regarding Pakistan-China friendship. A, that this friendship reflects the shared vision for regional stability and B, it is a testament to shared socio-economic vision as well of the region. How do you see these uh, statements and what more would you like to add to uh, Pakistan and China's tangent? of friendship, relationship, cooperation, collaboration, and so on and so forth. I think that uh, Pakistan and China have a shared vision and also have shared interests mm. in the region. Uh, not only in the region, but beyond the region, even in the Middle East. True. Uh, we have the same position on Palestine. Mm. In fact, China has, uh, uh, if you saw the remarks of Mr. Wang Yi, mm. the state councillor and foreign minister of China, mm. they were uh, as strong if not stronger than the Prime Minister of Pakistan mm -hmm. uh, on Palestine and uh, on Israel. So, we have the same uh, policy even there to that mm -hmm. extent. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think the uh, policy of non-interference mm -hmm. that China follows, mm -hmm. of not interfering in any other country's affairs, mm -hmm. no matter whatever the issue is, mm -hmm. I think is a very important policy because uh, uh, being a developing country itself, China mm -hmm. in the past, mm -hmm has uh, understood the importance of maintaining that sovereignty of other countries, mm. which we have seen that other big powers have not maintained. Exactly. And they have interfered. That respect for the sovereignty uh, of, of other countries. Despite the size of the country, mm. they have not engaged with other countries mm. based on their size, mm. based on the size of their military or the size of their economy. Mm. The island nation of Fiji is given the same respect mm. and has that when their leader comes to Beijing, meets mm. President Xi Jinping, this as uh, if equivalent to any other big country. Mm. 
like uh, Germany, for example, True. they are given the same mm -hmm. respect and engagement. I think so, this is a very cornerstone mm -hmm. of China's foreign I policy. I think Pakistan, uh, China's uh, foreign policy or China's uh, policy for its own country is something that needs to be emulated by many other countries, including Pakistan, because of the way it has progressed through the, uh, the policy and all that it uh, stipulates. Thank you so very much, Mustafa, to have joined us.